Hey, I just want to start off by saying this, that I miss you all. I got to tell you, it is the, the, the echo in this, in this empty room is, uh, it's deafening. It's really tough. And I uh, just want you to know, I can't wait for the day that we're back together and uh, you're here and we get to be worshiping here in the sanctuary. I want you to start off by, I want you to think about something in your life where you are, uh, when you were a kid that you wanted something, you wanted it so bad, you just couldn't think of anything else but that one thing. Maybe for, uh, for you it was, uh, it was a bike, or maybe, maybe it was a, a video game. I, I remember what it was for me. It was a board game, and it was, before, uh, it was before video games ever happened, and it was before Pong. Do you remember Pong? Pong is that, that very first video game that uh, this little ball would go from one side to the other, and then you had these, uh, you would play against somebody, and it would have this bar that you would go back and forth and you would have, anyways, it was before all that stuff, I wanted more than anything else, I was six years old, I remember this, I wanted the game Operation. Anybody remember the game Operation? It was so cool. You had these tweezers, and the tweezers, you would take them, and you would put them in, and, and you would pull out bones, and you tried to do it without touching the sides, and if you touched the sides, you would get shot. And I begged, I wanted it so bad, I begged my dad for it. And I even prayed, I said, God, would you please, would you please tell my dad to give me the game Operation? And, and while you're at it, I want a puppy. And anyways, my dad never got it for me. And the reason that he never got it for me, even though I begged him, my dad never got that game for me because on the, on the side of the game, Milton Bradley put this statement, it's for ages eight and up. I was only six, and so that was his excuse not to get me the game, and, 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 and I, I, I think I could have been an unbelievable surgeon. I think that, uh, uh, not having that game and, 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 and not liking to see blood, I think those are the two things that have kept me from being a great surgeon, but you know, we laugh about stuff that we wanted as kids, but for me, that was the first memory of being disappointed with God. And I remember praying, I remember praying, God, I really want that. I, if, if you're, God, if you don't get that, I, you know, where are you? And today we can laugh about those silly things that we wanted, those moments when we were kids, and we would want those things. And, but but I, I, if I'm really honest with you right now, I haven't outgrown that desire in my heart to want certain things and to pray desperate prayers. And my guess is there's some of you that you're today, you're praying desperate prayers. You're praying something for God to do something, for God to give you something. Some people this last week, you lost your job. And I just want you to know that our hearts go out for you. We've been praying for you. We've been saying, God, would you please restore our country and heal our country? And, and, and maybe for you, you're a couple and you desperately want to be parents. But for whatever reason, it's not happening right now. And that's your desperate prayer. Maybe there's some moms and dads and your kids have wandered away spiritually and your desperate prayer is you want them to come back. Maybe for you, your desperate prayer is your marriage is in trouble and you want your marriage to be fixed or, or there are people that, that want to be married and hey, forget eHarmony.com. It's, it's, it's ringbyspring.com. Come on, God, you got to do this. And there are many people who, who are praying desperate prayers for healing, whether it's for themselves or maybe they're praying it for somebody else in their life that they love. What I'm saying is this. What I'm saying is that every one of us can identify something in our life that is so important that you're praying a desperate prayer. You want that to happen. But the truth be told, it's not coming together the way that you would script it to come together. And let's make it just a, a little bit more personal. If you're sitting there with a group of people around you, would you just raise your hand if there's ever been a time or, or, or would you write amen and, and on, 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 as you respond. If there's ever been a time in your life where you felt God was not acting in the timing that you wanted him to act. Well, let me tell you about mine. My desperate prayer has to do with a friendship that exploded and feelings were hurt and it caused tremendous relational pain and, and feelings that, that I had of betrayal, feelings of brokenness, it, it's unbelievably strong. And, and, and I, I used to think that relational brokenness was just something for younger people, junior high kids, and, and that they struggled through and, 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 and that when I would get 20 or 30 or 40, that that, that would be gone. But I gotta tell you, here's what I've learned and that is pain is pain. Some of the greatest pain that we experience in life is relational pain. 
And when I think about my desperate prayer, and I probably think about it way too much, I gotta tell you, it grieves my heart. And, and my desperate prayer is I, I beg God to intervene and bring healing back to that friendship. But so far, God hasn't answered that prayer. That's mine. And for the sake of an illustration, here's what I wanna do today. I want I place this cup. Some of you saw this cup out here. I placed that cup there, and I want that cup to be the place that in your imagination that you place your desperate prayer. Just imagine that right now, that you're putting your desperate prayer right there in that cup. This cup is portable. You can take it with you. It fits right into my hand, and, 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 and you can always be, it's always there, so you can think about it. It's never too far away. And so I want you to think, just use your imagination. I want you to think about putting your desperate prayer right there, and just for the sake of this illustration. And then with, on the other hand, I, I want you to grab your Bible, and I want to take you, and, and we're going to come back to that, but I want you to think, I want you to, 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 to grab your Bible, turn to John chapter chapter 11, and we're going to see what happens when Jesus encounters some people who are praying desperate prayers. And today, here's my goal. My goal is that you would find strength and you would find hope in your time of praying that desperate prayer. And if you're here today and you're going, you know what, I really don't have anything that I'm desperate in prayer about. Well, don't worry, there will be a day soon when you have something like that, and you're going to be looking for these notes. So John chapter 11, it's the story of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, as Pastor Marcus was saying, Lazarus is very sick and what's interesting to me is that when Jesus finds out that his buddy is sick Jesus surprises everybody and doesn't do anything doesn't go anywhere and by the time that Jesus gets to Lazarus's house Lazarus is dead I'll give you the end of the story Lazarus doesn't stay dead and as I've studied this the past couple weeks this story incredible story I think there are five things that I see in Jesus that will give us hope and encouragement in our time of desperate prayer. So five things. Uh, Number one is this. The first thing I see in Jesus that will give us hope and strength is that Jesus demonstrates a unique timing, a unique timing. It's surprising to me that Jesus doesn't go to Lazarus right away. Verse five says this. So although Jesus loved Mary, uh, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, Jesus stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, Jesus said to the disciples, let's go back to Judea. (laughs) So by the time that Jesus gets to Lazarus, it's already been, now it's four days, and you put yourself in Mary and Martha's desperate prayer, you know, brother, uh, Jesus, heal our brother, come on, he's dying, and you have to imagine that they're they're, they're, they're going crazy. Jesus, come on, where, where are you? Don't you know that we're in pain? Don't you know? Don't you care? What's going on? For many of us, this is the moment of, that's so frustrating to us trusting in Jesus. Sometimes Jesus doesn't operate in our predetermined time schedule. Think about your own desperate prayer for just a moment. Maybe, maybe today you're feeling just like Martha and Mary because God is not showing up when you want him to show up. And here's what I want you, want you to see with a lot of people. They pray, oh God, I, I want you to show up in this area. But then here's the second thing we do, right on the end of God, I need you to show up in that desperate prayer in my life. But right on top of that, we we add this prayer, God, and I need this prayer answered by three o'clock Pacific Standard Time tomorrow. (laughs) See, when we do that, it totally disqualifies our trust. Trusting Jesus and time conditions those two things don't go together. For, for me to trust Jesus, I have to put my trust in his timing as well. And, and, and while that may be easy for some of you, I, I gotta tell you, just be honest with you, that's difficult for me. I feel like sometimes God, I was on vacation. I feel like God is not listening to me, that he's moving too slowly for my schedule. A big part of trust, though, is, is there's trust, and then right alongside of it is trusting God's timing as well. To walk with Jesus, part of it means I must trust the pace of his walk. And for a lot of us, me included in this, I trust Jesus, but the truth is I run ahead of him. I, I, I don't walk with him. I run ahead of him. When I, and, and when I run ahead of him, I begin to wonder, where is he? And I get mad. Where, why aren't you working? And trust and, and, and trusting God's timing. Those two things go together. But there's, there's more to learn in the story. I've got to keep on moving here. Second thing that we learn about Jesus, 
that's important for us that will give us hope and give us strength in our desperate prayer. Number two is that Jesus offers a bigger life, a bigger life. What Jesus is saying is whatever you put in that cup. I know it's big for you. I, I, I get that. I know it's, it, it, it's the biggest thing in your life right now. But, but the truth is, Jesus says, I offer you something that's so much bigger. And that's hard for us to understand because what's in that cup, that, that desperate prayer, it, it's huge for us. Verse 20, when Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she, she went to meet him. Mary stayed in the house. I find that interesting. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And so Jesus responds. He says, your brother will rise again. And Mary, Mary has, Martha, excuse me, has this, this small view, and, 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 and she gives an answer that, that, that I'm sure she learned when she was growing up, going to Sunday school in the temple. And yes, Martha said, here's her small view. He will rise when everyone else rises on the last day. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I am the resurrection and the life. Come on, that's an incredible statement. I am the resurrection and the life, and anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. And then he says this, do you believe this, Martha? <laughs> and what I love about this passage, this passage, this part of the, of the story, I love that Martha had the courage to stand up and go, you know, Jesus, if you were just here, you know, Things would have been different. Where were you? Why didn't you show up? If you had been here when we called you, if you would have come immediately, this, we wouldn't be in this situation. And I imagine Jesus saying, Martha, your brother will rise again. Do you believe this, Martha? Martha has this, 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 this little view. <laughs> and I don't blame her for having that little view because in real life, people... Don't rise from the dead. But Jesus is painting this bigger picture. And, and here she has this little view of eternal life. And, and, and she's thinking eternal life, heaven, that equals heaven. But Jesus is talking about eternal life, not just heaven, including heaven. But, but it's more than that. Jesus is talking about life right now. Listen, for most of my life, I had this limited view. When I heard people talk about eternal life, I always thought they were talking about, well, that's heaven. But lately I've been realizing that eternal life starts now. Eternal life starts when I place my trust in Jesus Christ. There's something bigger that's happening right now in my life. And I meet with people and, and, and they say things like this. They say, Craig, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful that my sins are forgiven. That's wonderful. That's in the past. And that's great. That's a good thing. And then I hear people talking about their future. And I say, they say, Craig, I, I'm so thankful that, that I know when I leave this earth, I'm going to be with Jesus Christ forever in heaven. That's wonderful. Their past is taken care of. Their future is taken care of. But I watch how they're living and they're just barely surviving right now. They have this passionless Christian life. They're barely hanging on. And I just want to say, that's not the Jesus life. That's not the spirit-led life that Jesus wants you to live. Let me paint this picture for you. Imagine that you know someone, and they've been given a, a pass to Disneyland, a free pass for the rest of their life. And, and they get to go free entrance anytime they want to go. And they just show them the pass and they get right in. And that person, they go to Disneyland about every week and, and they just continually go and go and go. But when they go to Disneyland, <laughs> the, all, all they do is they get in the entrance and they stand at the entrance and that's as far as they ever go. Do, do you remember the entrance of Disneyland? It's nice. They have great landscaping all around there. Technically, you know, you're in the park when you get to the entrance. It's exciting. Goofy and Mickey come out and, and, and they, 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 uh, they, they tell everybody hi and that's wonderful. But, but just think with me in this story. They just stay at the entrance. They're, they're not experiencing the whole kingdom. And if you knew somebody like that, wouldn't you want to go to them and say, listen, come on, you, you got to go inside. Right inside, the, right there, there's the, 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 the new kingdom, the, the kingdom of joy, the kingdom of adventure, the kingdom of fun. Come on, it's right there. There's so much more than just this entry right here. If you go in there, you get corn dogs and cotton candy. Come on, you're not experiencing the kingdom the way it's meant to be experienced. Sometimes I want to say to people, 
They're Christians. They, they've said yes to Jesus Christ, but they're kind of half-hearted. And there's no joy in their Christian life. And I want to look at them and say, come on. You're not experiencing the whole kingdom. The kingdom of God is not just when you die, you go to heaven. The kingdom of God is here and now as well. You, you, you're, you're missing out on this incredible adventure called life, living your life with Jesus Christ. Do you believe this, Martha? <laughs> and with nobody else in the room, I just want to look at you today and I want to say, Bob, do you believe that? You know, Ken, do you believe that? Lisa, do you believe that? Fred, you know, whoever, do you believe that the kingdom of God is now? Do you believe that? So what does that look like, Craig? I mean, come on, and be real with us. And so I, I thought about that this week, and I, I thought, okay, in my life, here's what I think about when I think about the kingdom of God. There's two statements that come to my mind. One of them is, I live with the presence of Jesus right here. And number two is I rely on the power of Jesus right now. Let me say it again. I live with the presence of Jesus right here, and I rely on the power of Jesus right now. For those of you contemplating tattoos, I think those two statements would make tremendous tattoos. You say, well, Craig, where do you get those two statements from? And I just flat out gonna tell you, I stole them. I stole them from the Bible. If you keep your finger here and the turn of me just a little bit over to the book of Ephesians, there's two places in Ephesians that I wanna take you to just real quick. Ephesians chapter three. Ephesians chapter three. I, here's what Paul writes. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources that God will empower you with the inner strength through his Holy Spirit. And then Christ will make his throne in your hearts as you trust in him. So I live, here's what Paul's saying. I live with the presence of Jesus right here. Meaning Jesus is making his home in my life. Wherever you are, that can be true for you. That you can say right here, right now, Jesus is is making his presence, his, he's living in me. And, and if that doesn't get you excited, you ought to check your pulse right now. This is a big, big deal. So I live with the presence of Jesus right here. And then here's a second statement. I rely on the power of Jesus right now. And it's in Ephesians chapter one where Paul writes this. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now track with me on this. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that's available to me. And the same power that raised Lazarus from the dead is the same power that's available to you right now. You can have it. You know what that means? That means that if you're a mom or a dad, if you're a single parent, if you're a coworker, if you're a friend, if you're a coach, if you're a mentor, if you teach school, if you're a student, no matter what age you are, it doesn't matter. Whatever your role in life is, you have limited power. You have limited power. That means that, you know, you try to change things, but you can't change them because you, have, you don't have the power to change. If you had the power to change, you would have changed, but you haven't changed, so you don't have the power. But the same power that created this playground we call earth is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Just go ahead and say amen or, or put a thumbs up on the screen and send it to somebody. And the Bible says the power, that power is available to you right now in your life. Jesus says, Craig, I have, I have a bigger view of life for you. Follow me into the kingdom. Quit staying around the entrance and camping out there. Follow my teachings, Craig. Come on, put to practice what I want, what I've told you to do. Uh, obey me, Jesus says. Quit relying on your own power, Craig, and surrender your life fully to Jesus Christ. Be yoked with me. That means walk with me because Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and I want you to start living, Craig. And he says that to you too. Come on, right now. Jesus' presence is right here and his power, you can rely on it. Number three, the third thing I see about Jesus that'll give us strength and hope in our time of, of desperate prayers is number three, Jesus reveals a, a heart that breaks. Anybody know the shortest verse in the Bible? 
I know you're saying it. You're shouting it right now. It's, uh, it's verse 35 in the same chapter we're in right now. It's John, uh, Gospel of John chapter 11, verse 35. It's simply this, Jesus wept. Would you say that? Say that verse with me. Come on. Let's memorize scripture right now. Jesus wept. That's just, we, we're, we're memorizing scripture in the translation that I use. The New Living uh, Translation, I, I use that a lot. They add a word, and it's then Jesus wept. I know for some of you, you're going, well, I'm out then. That, that's too many words. But verse 33, let's watch what happens. We'll work our way up to that verse. Verse 33, chapter 11. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him, and, and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him, Jesus asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus, then Jesus wept. There it is right there. And the people who were standing nearby said, see how much Jesus loved them. I love, this is such an incredible, incredible verse. It says that Jesus wept. You say, why did Jesus, was it because Lazarus had died? No, because Jesus knows he's gonna bring him back. And I, I think the reason that Jesus wept was that he sees Mary and Martha weeping. And his heart broke for the pain that was in Martha and Mary's heart. And his heart broke for those people that were grieving and and, and mourning the pain that they were experiencing. That pain broke the heart of Jesus. And I want to say this. Here's my point right here. And that is that Jesus' heart breaks when you have a broken heart. He cares that much. Okay, Craig, if he cares that much, then why doesn't he answer my desperate prayer, the prayer that I've been praying so fervently? Why doesn't he just answer that? And and there's a, you know, that's a really good question. And and I'm about to disappoint you because the answer is, I don't know. You know, I went to seminary. I spent four years going to graduate school. And and, and after all that studying, I got to tell you, it's a question I struggle with the most. I don't know. I have this finite mind, and this finite mind only goes so far. And I got to tell you, to be honest with you, I, I don't know. But what I do know is that God never stops loving you. Number four, the fourth thing I see about Jesus that brings me strength and and, and brings me hope in my desperate prayer. Number four is that Jesus displays a power that transforms. And and the the wording of that point, the power that transforms, that's a little bit redundant because really all power transforms. It's essentially what power does. I, I, I know this firsthand. When I was a child, my mom looked at me, and I'll never forget the statement. She said, Craig, you know, if you take a safety pin and you put uh, a safety pin in that electrical outlet, it'll shock you. Don't ever do that. And I don't know why, but my, I, I, I never thought of it before. But when my mom said that, it was like, wow, that, you know, a light went on in my head. And I went, you know what? One of these days, I, I, I'm going to put that in my bucket list right behind putting a fork in a toaster, seeing what's going to happen. And so one night I was kind of curious and I took out a safety pin. I know you're sitting there, you're going, you are not that stupid. No, I am. I, I, I guarantee you. And I took a safety pin and I put an electric, uh, electrical socket and I wanted to see what was going to happen. And I put it in one side of that thing and nothing happened. I thought, big deal. She was wrong. She didn't know what she was talking about. But then I thought, I got this great idea. What if I take two safety pins and I kind of put them together and then I put them in both the holes and when I did that, boom, <laughs> there it was. The, you know, I, a little more shock than I got when I played Operation. I got a little shock. It was more like shaking the hand of Satan. You know, it just wouldn't let go. And, and, and that power, listen, power shocks you. Power, power transforms you. Hear me on this. Power changes you. And Jesus delivers a different type of power. Verse 39 talks about it. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told him, but Martha, but Martha, the dead man's sister, protested. This cracks me up. She said, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. Now, come back to me just for a second. For those of you who are raised reading the King James Version, You know that there's, here's how the King James Version says what what Martha says. She says, Lord, by this time, he stinketh. (laughs) I I always find, let's get back here. Jesus responded, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside, and then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sake of these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. And then Jesus shouts. This is one of my favorite parts of all of scripture. Jesus shouts, Lazarus, come out. 
And then there's this long pause. And it says, and the dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound in grave clothes. I'm going to come back to that. His hands and his feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Now, what's interesting to me about this last part is I, I find it interesting that there was this delay, I think, in my mind, in my imagination, between when Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out, and when Lazarus actually came out. And so my question that I've been wrestling with is, okay, what's going on? Between the time where Jesus says, Lazarus, come out, and when he actually appears, do they believe? Is there a lot of doubt? Oh, he's not doing that. (laughs) And all of a sudden, boom, right there, he's there. And and the question for us is not, did Jesus have the power? I I, I think most of us know that Jesus has the power. I, I think the question really comes down to is, do you believe? And do you trust Jesus with your life? And do you trust him with everything that's in this cup? Do you believe? And here, here's what I find in my own life. I often limit God's power in my life when I don't fully trust him. Yes, Jesus, I trust you with my life. I trust you with this area in my life. But if I'm really honest... There's those times soon after that I say that, that I start to worry and I start to fear and I start to try to control. And so for you, when it comes to your desperate prayer, are you putting your trust in the power of Jesus Christ? Or are you just putting your trust in yourself and and you are trying to control it and you're trying to fix it and you're trying to worry about it. You're thinking about it all the time and it's consuming you. Which brings me to the fifth thing. The fifth thing that I see Jesus in the story that gives me hope in my desperate prayer, gives me courage in my desperate prayer is this, that Jesus calls the community to help. In the last verse that we're gonna look at, there's nine words. But there's one word that is really, really important. It's easy to overlook, but it's a powerful word. Here's the nine words. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Did you see it? It, It's that word them. He told them. He told the community. Jesus invites the community to come and get involved. Why did Jesus instruct other people to come and take off the grave clothes? Because there was something about community that the community gains by actually touching, physically touching the pain of somebody else. Getting so close to the odor of a, 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 of a once dead friend. Maybe there's something about connecting with each other that, it, it, that in the deepest, rawest moments of one's life, that it benefits everybody. That maybe real life is more than just doing a Bible study. That maybe, maybe real community is, is deeper than that. When I was getting close to my 40th birthday, just a couple years ago, I decided that I'd run a marathon, 26.2 miles. And I, the training was just bru- bru- grueling, and, and it was rough, and, and, and came time for race day, and I, I had one goal that, that I wanted in my life, and that was I wanted, I wanted to beat, Oprah Winfrey had, had run a race just a month or two before that, and she run it in four and a half hours, and my goal to run the marathon was to run it in less than four and a half hours. But when I, what I realized in being part of that community of runners was they actually kind of do things the way I think the church ought to be. Because the marathon came and came time for running and, and we ran through the communities of Dallas, Texas. And, and here's what I saw that I wasn't expecting. I saw the community of people coming out onto the curbs. And as the, as the people stood on the curbs, they would yell out. They would go, hey, number 4269, whatever, on, on my bib, the number that I had, whatever it was. And, and keep on going. Come on, keep on running. You can do it. I was in a class called the Clydesdales, and I, I, they never told me why I was in that class, but they would, they would applaud, and they would cheer, and come on, Clydesdale was on my, on my bib, and, and they, come on, Clydesdale, keep on clodding, keep on going. And listen, I, I believe that every follower of Jesus Christ needs to have people in your life who are looking at you on a regular basis, and they're saying, I'm with you. You can do it. 
I know that your marriage stinks right now, but I'm praying for you. I, I want to encourage you. And, and I, I know somebody that you love has passed away, but I'm grieving with you. You're not alone. And I know your kid has walked away, but, but you're not alone in this. And we're going to walk with you through this tough time. And I, I know you're in chemotherapy right now. And, and I'm going to hold your hand. We're going to go through this together. And we're going to battle through this together. We need a community of people in our lives. And if you'll just open up to it, There'll be people that you can connect with in a small group. If you just let us know, we would love to connect people in your life that will cheer you on just like that. Let me go to one last thing and then we're done. When Jesus says, and I told you I was gonna come back to this. When Jesus says, unwrap Lazarus and let him live. I just wanna say this as I close today. You and I, we have been given a new life. Come on, this is great. Yet some Christians... They, they continue to live their life as though they're wearing grave clothes. You say, what do you mean grave clothes? I mean grave clothes of doubt, grave clothes of fear, grave clothes of shame and guilt. Those are not the right clothes you're to be wearing. Those are garments of death. You have been set free. So trust Jesus with your, with your desperate prayers. Trust in Jesus and believe that he loves you and believe that he has the power to come and help you with whatever it is you're struggling with today. Listen, I know you're praying desperate, desperate prayers, but, but this is the secret sauce to living the fullest life that God has available to you. Here's the secret sauce. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Come on, let's live our lives like we really believe that statement. It'll make a difference. Pray with me, Heavenly Father, Would you give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard? That we would trust you. That we would not worry. We wouldn't fear. We wouldn't try to control things. We would just say, God, we trust you and we trust your timing as well. And we would say, God, we believe you have the power to work in our lives, even when we don't see it, even when, even when we're not even sure you're there. We believe that you're there, and we believe you have the power. Give us the wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard today. And then, Jesus, would you give us the courage to do it? In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen.